Hey, before we get started, just a heads up that we've got some awesome stuff on BJJ Mental Models Premium you probably want to know about. We've got some collaborative work with Andrew Wiltsey, with Margot Ciccarelli, and with John Thomas. At the moment, we're getting close to about 50 hours of premium stuff on there, and the library is always growing. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. There's a free trial, so there's no risk. If you try it and you don't like it, I'll happily refund it because I'm pretty sure that you will like it. Hundreds of other people already do. Please do check it out if you haven't already. Premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. One more time, that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Thanks again for supporting us, and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 189. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach. And I'm rolling today with a first timer to the podcast, Sonia Sillin. Sonia, how are you doing? Hey, Steve. I am doing awesome. How are you? I am doing well. As I was mentioning to you earlier, just finally escaped COVID quarantine and I'm back at home. (laughs) I've never been so happy to see a negative test in my life, but uh, there we are. So much better, back to normal and happy to be recording with you here today. Awesome. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So with that said, we were talking a little bit on the pre-show just as we were organizing about your background. But of course, the listeners didn't have the, the benefit of hearing all of that. So why don't you go ahead and just give yourself a quick introduction? Yeah, absolutely. I have been training jujitsu 13 years. I recently received my black belt from Hanat Stuck. I've also ran my own gym for the last 10 years, Combat Arts Academy in Seattle. My background, so prior to jujitsu, I actually did Taekwondo for about 16 years. So that's what led me down the martial arts path. And I've been coaching for the last 20 years or so. Nice, nice. So on that note, something that we were talking about and why you were actually referred to the podcast is to dig into the nature of running a jujitsu business. And you had talked earlier about important variables like managing customer retention. Something that we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast recently is how people in the jujitsu community we're not really taught how to run a jujitsu business. A lot of people just kind of fall into that because it seems like the obvious next step for you after your competitive days. But it, most people who do this, they kind of learn on the job. And what we're trying to do here on the podcast over the last few episodes is provide people with a bit more color in terms of how they can do that more successfully out of the gate to give kind of a bit of an education <laughs> on that. And the best way to do that is to talk to people like yourself who have done it before. So, I mean, with that said, that's kind of a, a broad opening, and there's a lot that we can talk about here and dig into, but I'm, I'd like to give the floor to you here and let you just get started on this conversation, maybe in terms of how to get a gym going. Tell me about your story and what led you to the decision to create a gym and what kind of challenges you encountered along the way. Oh, there's so much to unpack here. Yeah. So I have two degrees. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Linguistics. I have a Bachelor of Science in Speech and Hearing Sciences. I was in the process of applying to graduate schools. I was never supposed to run a gym. My life path was nine to five or something a little bit beyond that, but this was never in my planned future. So this was originally, actually, this story is a little bit complicated. It's kind of hard to backtrack and get into this a little bit. So I was dating someone whose pipe dream was to open up and run a gym. And I really believed in his vision and I wanted to bring that dream to a reality. And so we knew nothing about running a business. We started off with six total business partners and found some money. I maxed out my credit cards with this process and we found a big old empty warehouse and began what was West Seattle Fight and Fitness in August of 2012. And at the time, we didn't have any additional revenue. It was chaos. It was kind of horrendous, actually, because we were barely getting students in the door. One by one, our business partners failed until it was my partner and I. And then we had to seek out resources to help our business development. Because contrary to popular belief, good jujitsu does not mean good business. Good jujitsu also doesn't mean that you're a good teacher. And a good teacher is what retains the students. 
Yeah, absolutely. All of this kind of strikes home to me and is something that I've seen myself many times. People, they go into jujitsu gym ownership thinking basically, hey, if you build it, they will come, <laughs> right? Exactly. But there's a lot more thought that goes into it than that. I mean, you brought up a lot of things that are probably very common questions for gym owners, such as what do I do in regards to financing this thing? You know, do I need to have a lot of money down, a lot of money ready? Should I accumulate mm -hmm. debt? That's always one thing that people want to ask about. Another thing, of course, is do I go into this with partnerships? And I'd love to explore your experience on both of those, because that's one of the first and most fundamental questions to opening up a gym. Like, how do I pay for it and who do I do it with? I guess are the two the two big things. How did you eventually land on the model that worked for you there? Because it sounds like what you're saying is you had to do a lot of pivots out of the gate because what you tried out of the gate didn't work exactly as anticipated. How did you eventually get onto the, the point where you were able to come up with good answers to those questions? Great question. So 10 years of operating, I would say it's been about nine years of trial and error for the jujitsu portion. In the business portion, we're still trialing and erroring a little bit here and there. So when we opened up West Hill Fight and Fitness, I was working 40 hours a week. I was also doing a lot of the administrative work for the gym and I mean, the build out, like a little bit of everything. So it was pretty hands-on. About eight months in, that's when we actually switched our affiliation to Street Glass Gym and they gave a lot of good business advice. So having a little bit of mentorship went a very, very long way. And so eight months in, I quit my full-time job. We took a leap a leap of faith and I was full-time administrator for the gym. So we had to figure out how to get people in the door. And that's not just like, hey, well, here's the phone number. Let me call them. Let me see like what they want to do. Like, oh, they want karate. Like, oh man, we don't have that here. We had to learn how to talk to people. And that I think it's the biggest thing that gets overlooked. You're not just trying to get people in the door. You're selling yourself. You're selling your business. You're selling your coaching. You're selling your vision. And part of that means connecting with and talking to people to bring them into your vision. And so at that point, it began the journey of learning how to talk to people, um, that, that communication side of things. And so we were looking at anybody interested in training as a prospect. We had a process that we created. So with our prospect, we'd call them, we would schedule them for their consultation. They would come in, we would do a one-on-one -on -one tour, a 20 minute private lesson and then go through a sales pitch. At that time, we were requiring contracts and it, it was a pretty like hard sales pitch. Sign up today, get this great deal. Otherwise, here's a regular price. And so that process has evolved with time. I left the Straight Blast Gym affiliation and joined a different team. They were a little more money minded than I was in terms of hardcore business. Being people focused generates revenue correctly. And so at that time, I actually switched my process. I started doing trial classes because we wanted people to experience what we offer. What I found with doing the one-on-one -on -one consultations is that they don't get a real taste for what our program is like. We don't know if they're going to be a good fit. They don't know if we're a good fit. By doing the consultation, it almost tells them like, hey, I'm actually not so sure in my program. I want to do this like one-on-one -on -one lesson, make sure you like this little private lesson with me. Therefore, you get signed up. I wanted to switch the focus and have them trial the class and experience that. And so I treat it like a whole experience. They come in, they onboard with the staff, whether it's me or my friend desk people. They do the trial class. And then after the class, we close them. And there's a sales pitch, but it's not a sketchy sales pitch. It's, hey, how'd you enjoy class? Is this something that you want to do? Okay, let's go over pricing. Here are options. Let's get you signed up. So it's a start to finish process because what happens is there's no follow through typically. Like you call somebody, they come in whenever, they drop in, there's no appointment scheduled, there's no system. And once you put that system in place, everything falls in place. So that's a really interesting point here and something that I'm guessing that a lot of people who have done this before probably can relate to. I mean, I've certainly felt this pain myself, which is that mm -hmm. as you're getting off the ground, you are 
usually honestly pretty desperate just to get anyone in the door who will sign up right you're looking for some sort of revenue and you yeah yeah, and and it often feels like the right thing to do should be to go above and beyond and do everything you can to make a positive first impression for people so that they sign up and the way that a lot of gyms do that is specifically by doing what you talked about where they'll offer an introductory private and they'll provide some degree of one-on-one time before the person joins the regular classes and signs up and all of that is done with good intentions right because you're ultimately trying to put your best foot forward and give as much value as you can to a person so that they'll eventually think wow this this gym has gone above and beyond i'm going to sign up here and that might work but the challenge with that approach like you said is number one that you're not giving the person a representative example of what they're actually paying for right you're you're not giving them a trial you're giving them a sales pitch it might feel like you're doing them a huge favor to give them a one hour private prior to them signing up with you but the reality is you haven't shown them what an actual class is going to be like if you're just doing private lessons with them before they join and the challenge is in something like jujitsu so much of what the experience really is is sparring right i mean i I kind of feel like people have to have informed consent when they sign up they have to know what they're really getting into for a combat art like jujitsu and it's hard to get all of that in a private lesson and the other concern is just time and bandwidth if you've got a, a sufficient amount of people coming in the door it gets to the point where you simply can't realistically do those one-on-one breakout sessions with every new person anymore so you've got to find a middle way and you've got to find some way to get them into something resembling a class so that they at least know what they're signing up for and at the same time making them feel like they're you know that you care about them and that you're invested in them and that you want them to be there but at the same time you've got to do that in a way that's sustainable for you as well as the business owner absolutely And there are two key words that I think are really important to this. And I feel like a lot of gym owners tend to overlook this because within jiu-jitsu, we talk about not having ego. There is a lot of ego involved in both gym owning and teaching, especially if you're the black belt of the academy. Transparency and authenticity. Be transparent in what you're doing and be authentic in how you do it. And I think those two things bring that vision to reality, right? Like if you're not who you say you are, if if you're not honest, then that really affects the business because then it affects the students, it affects the training environment, it affects the culture. And so the hard balance within jiu-jitsu is constantly towing the line between business and jiu-jitsu. I think that it is an important distinction in jiu-jitsu that, look, if you are going to own a jiu-jitsu gym, that is way more different than just teaching a class. So if someone is planning to start a gym and they think, well, I've taught classes before. All I have to do if I want to run a gym is just teach a whole bunch more of them. That is not the case. I mean, there is so much administrative work, business development work, finances, stuff that you have to do there that is going to consume a massive amount of your time unless you have someone else on your team who can take care of that for you. So I I think that that is an important thing for jujitsu people to understand is owning a gym does not mean you're doing jujitsu all day every day there's a lot of business administration you have to do if you want to actually run a gym and get it off the ground absolutely so this i'm going to ramble for a minute because i think there are a lot of little points that come in with that that comment um so the way that we run things we don't do contracts we don't do commitments we don't do a sign up fee we have a 60 day money back guarantee that we stand by like if you're attending consistently two times a week for the first two months and you don't like it, we will refund every penny. Stipulation is that you're attending two times a week because that develops good habits. It means you're giving it a fair shot. Within that, we have to cultivate a program that helps foster that growth and retention of that member. So having an introductory class, like a level one class, a foundational class, where it's teaching people how to jujitsu. So I recently took over our program in April. We had a lot of transition, lots of changes. It's one thing I am queen of is dealing with gigantic obstacles and massive changes within my gym. And when I took it over, I redesigned our level one curriculum. And the way I teach that class and program, it's here's what jujitsu is. Here are the warmups. Here are why these movements are important. Here is the basic escape. Here's the overall framework of what you are doing. Um, Here is 
this movement in a very controlled environment in a live drilling scenario. So for example, close guard bottom, we show a little bit of top on how to hold good close guard, the white belt, what not to do, like reaching your arms inside. Here are sweeps and how to break the posture from bottom. Here are the options that you have. And then creating a very controlled environment where they get to try that and relax because we all know what happens when you put a brand new person into a live scenario, human nature kicks in. They go into fight or flight, and that's where the spazzy white belt comes in. It's the fight. Or or you freeze, and you don't know how to react. But being able to do these controlled drills, they get to actually see, like, okay, person inside guards give me, like, 10%, 20%. They're not opening. They're just trying to maintain. Oh, wow, this is really hard. Can I hit this movement in a controlled environment? Now it's up intensity a little more. That gives them a better understanding of jujitsu and how to train in a safe environment. And then from there, they move into all the classes. And we recently redesigned our schedule to have hard, intense training days, to have kind of a comprehensive all levels class, as well as the introductory class. That's a really interesting way to kick off the student experience when they get on the mats is to help instill that sense of safety for them so that they understand what's going on and so that they don't go into fight or flight. And that's something that I don't think enough gyms really put enough thought into. Yeah. I mean, I remember, and I'm sure you remember when, when we started out training, at least at my gym and most of the gyms that I knew, the pitch was very UFC oriented for lack of a better term. Oh, 100%. Yeah. The idea was that jujitsu is a self-defense art and what better way to show the effectiveness of the art than to throw people into a live scenario. So from day one, I remember being thrown in there with a bunch of blue belts who kicked my ass. And of course, that was by design. The whole point was to show me the effectiveness of this martial art. So they basically put me in an unwinnable situation. And the idea is you try that out and you think, oh, wow, this art is amazing. And you sign up because you've seen firsthand how well it works. And I mean, all of that is understandable. But the problem is, like you said, you're throwing unwinnable trained people directly into a combat scenario before they even have any idea how to do it safely. So like there have been times when I'm sparring with new white belts, you know, you can have them in a submission and they don't even know that they're in a submission. They don't even know that there's danger there because they have no point of reference to understand it. And I sort of feel like if you want to do right by your students, you really need to be focused on building an environment of safety before you throw them into the fight pit. So I like that idea very much of creating an atmosphere where where people feel safe and they understand that this is a practice, this isn't fight club, and that they need to focus on getting better, not on beating up their opponent. Imagine learning how to tap in your first month of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> we just finished. So this week within our intro curriculum, it's a mission week. So you're learning how to put on like an arm bar, triangle choke, cross choke, or naked choke, whatever, a simple submission. And then you're learning how to tap. You're learning how to protect your joints. So part of part of how I teach and how I run my business, I have been constantly broken. I started jiu-jitsu a year after I had reconstructed hip surgery. And I'm hypermobile. And you put those two things together and like while my joints are lax and I can go to the I can go past the point of extension is not the best for longevity. And so I just had a baby 18 months ago. My, my pregnancy was rough. Postpartum was rough physically. I had biceps and I had foot pain, ankle pain, hip pain, all the things. Like I was not physically able to train hard until about three months ago. So my entire like physical journey has led me to this point where I don't want my students to experience the same stuff that I went through. Like, oh, my knee got tweaked. It's fine. I'll for sure, no big deal. It, it's the flip, like learn how to protect your, your joints now so you're not out for a long period of time later on. Because what happens too, as I'm sure you've experienced, like residual injuries over and over again, they're repetitive. And then now your shoulders just tweaked. You have neck pains and disc issues. And why? Yeah. If you learn how to do it safely from the beginning. And again, this ties back into the business in jiu-jitsu because you're learning like it's not be good now it's be good later like you're learning how to do it so you're learning how to do all this stuff and that takes time so how can you set your students up for success yeah and part of that is also providing resources i have a sports medicine place that i recommend my students to but five ten minutes away you have a tweak you have an issue you're not sure how to deal with it go see somebody. I have two strength and conditioning coaches in my gym. They're phenomenal resources. People that want to train long-term, I advocate that they also 
take care of their bodies and have functional strength. We talk about how not to get stuck. We talk about how to prevent injury and how to be good training partners, like not rolling rough, not trying to smash something out of their head, not stubborning your way through a choke. Because at that point, while while it's still a choke and it's a blood choke, but you're also still damaging the ligaments in your neck, the muscles get strained, your cervical spine is not designed to do that, especially when it becomes a crank. So why be stubborn during class? That's what a competition's for. Yeah, yeah. That is an important mindset for people to develop earlier on in their journey rather than later. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anyone could ever pull stats on this, but I would love to know what percentage of debilitating injuries occur at white belt versus at the higher belts? Because if I had to guess, I would guess that there's a disproportionate number of devastating injuries that happen at white belt. We just don't hear much about it because people come into jujitsu within the first month, they get some massive injury, they're turned off and they just never come back again. Whereas if someone is a black belt and they get injured, they're probably going to go through rehab and come back to the mats at some point. But at that white belt level, you don't know what's safe or not. You don't know how to train and protect yourself and train your opponent, at least not at the beginning. And my intuition tells me that there's probably a lot of potential students that we fail to retain because things like injuries drive them off in the first few months. So I'm actually going to take a step beyond that and say white and blue belts. You hear about the blue belt blues? I injured myself more at blue belts in jiu-jitsu than any other belts. And Part of that for me, I didn't see a lot of success in my technique until my blue belt. And part of that's being one of the only females training, trying to hit a sweep on a guy my size without understanding leverage, not as effective as trying to hit hit it on a female my size. And so for me to roll with other women, I had to compete a lot. And so I got pulled in triangle choke, pulled in armbar, kimura. I got injured a lot at blue belt because I had to compete to figure out how to roll. And then on that note, back to white belts, I I had a guest professor here for a week and I had to tell him to stop letting my brand new students roll because within the first week, two students quit because one hurt his knee and the other one hurt his shoulder. And that professor, as a very senior black belt, told me that I can't tell him what to do because he's a black belt, despite the fact that it is my business and these are people getting injured. That's amazing. So you were employing this guy and he told you that you can't tell him what to do? Oh, I mean, I have I have had a black belt tell me to my face that a purple belt should never tell a black belt what to do. Oh, boy. Despite the fact that at the time I was sole owner of this business, my sole job was to grow my business. My only focus was the safety and longevity of these students. And there was no collaboration. It was a uh, my way or the highway. And I don't operate that way. I'm a very collaborative individual. I want feedback. I want your opinions. I want us to talk and find a resolution. I'm really big on communicating. And I've had many points in my journey where I've had to deal with a head of the program pulling the rank card on me. Yeah, that is in my mind, one of the more notorious issues with jujitsu in general. And I think part of it stems down to, you know, you talked earlier about the ego that gets wrapped up in in the sport, particularly for black belts. I do find it funny that people are constantly going on and on about the importance of humility, but then they will conduct themselves in the exact opposite manner. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a sport where we all wear a little piece of colored cloth that's supposed to tell everyone how awesome we are. So I don't think we can really run around and say it's an egoless sport. I mean, I would personally personally prefer if there weren't a belt system, because I think it does get exploited in a lot of ways where, you know, you brought up a great example. People will assume that the the belt that they're wearing protects them from criticism or they can pull rank. I mean, it's just a piece of cloth, right? It, it's not even a piece of cloth that is accredited or certified in any meaningful way. All a black belt means is that some other person thought that you were good enough that they would be willing to give you this black belt. It's not some standardized test that isn't representative of character or even really of your ability as much as it should be. So I am personally not a huge fan of the belt system precisely because of that, because you can get into these situations where people try to create this fake hierarchy where you're not allowed to question the black belt. And I think that's always bad news. 100%. And this actually ties nicely into the conversation about volunteer versus coach versus employee. So I have seen and met many people that feel obligated to their coach. They volunteer 
to teach, whether it's one or two classes a week or five or 10 classes a week. So one thing that I do at my gym is I pay my coaches, um, I pay my staff. Payroll is actually a very large chunk of my overhead. And I say that because while I have members that want to volunteer out of the goodness of their heart, I very much value their time, right? They are still paying members of this gym. They are, whether it's with payment or with a service. So if I have somebody coaching two price a week and they need to back down, great, let's talk about it. They want to add more, great, let's talk about it. I'm in the process of trying to create an effective trade system where like if you're leading a class, it's worth like X amount. If you're assisting a class, it's worth X amount. At the end of the month, they can turn that log in and either they get credited that amount, they owe a small amount, or they get paid for this excess. And I'm talking in terms of, um, I have... I have several coaches that volunteer at the kids program and they're phenomenal. And I so appreciate their time because they go above and beyond and out of their way to be there for kids. I know at a lot of gyms, like people are undervalued. Coaches are undervalued. Volunteers are undervalued. I once been a black belt that was getting paid 20 bucks to teach each class. And I believe they were teaching like 20 classes a week, something insane. And I think it's one of the, those things people don't realize, like when you start to treat people with value, they rise up instead of down. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And this is a a very much a topic of passion for myself. And it's a, a rampant problem in my mind in the jujitsu community, unpaid labor. There are way too many coaches who think that they have some sort of control or influence over their students and expect a degree of free labor. I mean, I see this even with coaches that I would generally consider to be otherwise good. As soon as they, they need something or they need help, they will immediately go and try to mobilize their student base to work for free for them. And there's never any talk about compensation or or otherwise doing a make good. I mean, if you're lucky, you might be able to get some sort of discount on your training. But even then, I mean, I, I don't think that's sufficient. I think ultimately you should pay people for the work that they do for you. We've talked a lot on this podcast before about cult-like tactics that gyms use. And I, I mean, I think you would agree, this is a pretty rampant problem in jujitsu where people, especially instructors, will abuse their position to exert influence over their students. And I get some incredible listener email from people asking questions like, hey, Steve, you know, you were talking about gym owners who abuse their students. Hey, uh, my instructor, he asks me to come over every night and cook him dinner. Does that count as abusive behavior? It's like, fuck, get out of there. Oh my And gosh. this happens all the time. I hear all of these stories from people where their instructor goes way beyond just hey, can you teach this class for free? But right down to, hey, can you drive me around town? Can you provide for me from a food standpoint? Can you provide free business services to me? I mean, that kind of stuff is incredibly common in jujitsu and really would never fly in any walk of life other than jujitsu. And I think a big part of that comes down to the worship of the black belt in a lot of ways, right? That symbol is easily exploited by instructors who are looking to exploit. So that is very much a concern for me when when you're looking at starting up a jujitsu business and you touched on this beautifully, which is that, look, you know, an abundance mindset will pay dividends. If you are good to the people around you, they'll be good to you. If you try to exploit them and extract value out of them, the opposite is going to happen. Right. And so I think that if you want to build a good, sustainable business, you've got to be willing to pay for value rather than trying to cheap out on everyone around you. Well, that also ties in with putting money back into your business. So I say that because oftentimes too, like, People are paying you X amount of money a month. You're profitable. Your overhead's super duper low. You have rents, you have utilities maybe, and you pay yourself. But the mats are run down. The bathroom's gross. The water fountain's broken, if there even is one. The mop heads are broken. There's not enough cleaner. People don't reinvest back into their business and take care of their facility, which means they're not taking care of their students. Because oftentimes they hear the, well, there's not enough money. There's not enough money because you're pocketing the rest of your money. Which, I mean, if that's your prerogative, wonderful. But if you're planning on teaching jujitsu, if you're planning on doing this for a lifetime, you have to invest in your facility and people. So one thing that we do, and for anybody out there that's trying to do gym projects that doesn't quite have the resources, or for anybody out there that's trying to do gym projects and renovations, but, you, but you're lacking in the financial resources, oftentimes we'll do paid and full membership specials. So people can prepay for six to 12 months. Maybe there's an added bonus, like you get a month free or free gi. And then 
that will help to fund the next construction project or like getting maps in in, or the water fountain or whatever it is that you need to do for your facility. Because the month to month memberships, those pay the bills and the paid in full memberships help to fund projects is how I look at that. That's actually a really interesting model because I think when people pay in full, this comes up a lot because most gyms will offer a program like this where there's a month to month Mm -hmm. or you can pay a year up front, for example, and you get some sort of discount. And I think that the where a lot of instructors probably screw up is they don't save that money and they don't plan for what to do with that money. They just pocket that money when they get a big windfall. And then the problem, of course, is, look, if you're getting your students to pay in full up front, that's great because you get more money now. But it means you have to then manage that money more carefully because it's going to be a another 12 months before you get another dime from that student. Assuming that that student actually stays on track. Yeah, if they leave, then you don't get anything. The benefit to month to month is as an instructor, you don't have to do as much math. You know, you get this roughly the same amount of money every month and it's very predictable. Money goes in, money goes out. You don't have to do a lot of thought. Whereas if you're getting people to pay up front or in advance, it's very easy to just say, hey, windfall and put that money in your pocket now and do something with it that doesn't help the gym. But yeah, like you said, if the water fountain breaks, you know, three months from now, if you don't have that money on hand and you're not willing to invest it in your gym, then everything just kind of falls into disarray. And this is where it's so important to, again, as the business owner, and any business owner will tell you this, for any successful business owner, know your numbers. If you don't know how much money is coming in, if you're not sure what's going to be coming in the next month or two, you have to take a hard look at your finances. So shameless plug, I use Zen Planner. They are phenomenal for keeping metrics. It's really helped me stay on top of my finances and knowing what's coming in, what's going out past due bills, all of it. It's pretty automatic. Zone Planner, you can track all the data. And so knowing your numbers isn't just how much money, it's how many people are quitting, how many people are signing up, what's going to retail, what are each of your revenue streams making? So for example, like it's not just jujitsu, it's adults and kids. It's two separate metrics. Do you do Muay Thai? What's the cost there? How can you grow the program? What's lacking? Why is it not working? Like all of these things help to build a good business. And so within the metrics, if you actually look at your attrition rate, how many people are you losing? Big box gyms, like the general health and fitness industry, their attrition rate is 30 to 50% a year, roughly. That's about how many people will quit. Martial arts gyms, a lot lower. I think typically speaking, jujitsu gyms see about 10%. So you lose 10 members per 100 you have signed up. Currently, we have about 360 members signed up between adult jiu-jitsu, kids jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, and strength and conditioning. Our monthly attrition is between 2 and 3%. Nice. And I think that's really, really, really big in being able to build your business. Yeah. I think another important reason to have an eye on the numbers is because if you're like a lot of businesses getting off the ground, I mean, you've talked about this, I've talked about this, you have to do a lot of experimenting and not all of your experiments are going to work. And it's very hard to know which experiments are working and which ones are not unless you have that data. What often you'll probably find if you look at the data is there are going to be some areas of your business that are generating a lot of money and others that are just not. Or maybe they are generating money, but the amount of effort required to provide that service is so expensive that it it isn't even worth doing. And you've got to have that information because you always want to be focusing on the things that are generating money with as little effort as possible versus things that are just a massive slog to sell or they're so expensive to provide in terms of services that you just don't make any money off of them. And the only way you can do all of that analysis is is if you have the data. And I would agree with you that most jujitsu gyms probably could not even begin to tell you the answers to those questions. Like, what is my monthly churn? What percentage of my students fall into the adults versus kids programs? That kind of stuff is critical information. And yeah, if you don't have that as a gym owner, you absolutely need to be figuring out how to get it. Well, also true, that reminds me, oftentimes there might be an area of the business or the program that isn't working. Like maybe, for example, like we started getting an onslaught of teens. Like we have so many like teens that are trying to sign and not just teens, teens and teens that we added on a junior class that is thriving. And so now we're looking at the schedule and with the new change, hopefully we can add more classes for them to attend because 
while teens and tweens can attend adult class, oftentimes they grow better within a class of their peers. But you can't put a 13-year-old in the same class as a three-year-old. So you have to figure out how to how to fix that. And it can't be a band-aid. Like you have to figure out an actual solution. And it could be something small. Like why are there no small people in our gym? Why did that person quit? Why is this happening here? Why is nobody buying my retail? Where am I bleeding money? Um, you have to look at all the small things. Yeah. Yeah. These are questions that I think a lot of people they'll whine about, but they won't do the introspection on. So people, you know, you brought up, why are there not many women in my gym? Why do I not have many small people in my gym? Questions that often come up, you know, every jujitsu instructor out there will say, you know, I want to have more women in my gym. Jujitsu is for everyone. But, you know, why aren't there more women training? But if you actually look at their gym, they're probably not doing anything at all to make that gym a place that would be hospitable for anyone outside of the the stereotypical demographic, right? I mean, look, if you don't even have a women's changing room in your gym, you shouldn't be surprised if women don't want to train there, right? Little things like that. What kind of cultural signals is your gym giving off? Is your gym culture very much kind of like, you know, wannabe alpha bro type culture? Are you always playing gangster rap and heavy metal in the background? You know what? There are signals that you as the gym owner can send off, which can make it easier or harder for people to see that they could be a good fit for your gym. And if you're putting up a bunch of obstacles that send people the impression that, hey, this isn't the place for me, of course, they're not going to train there. And it's your job as the gym owner to see those gaps and to try to close them. Absolutely. So here's a, a story to kind of support that right there. So speaking of changing rooms, when we moved into the space, there's two separate rooms. One was attached to the bathroom. So that changing room was the women's changing room along with the ladies' bathroom. And then the other restroom just outside was the men's restroom. And then the room next door was the guy's changing room. And it was that way for a while. I wasn't super happy with it because both rooms were pretty grungy. And like, it was just, it was just gross. Like I did not enjoy what I had there. And then we got more and more families in. And then I have the dad that has the daughter that's trying to take the daughter to the bathroom, but the daughter doesn't want to use the men's changing room or sorry, the men's bathroom. What do we do? And then also as you get, non-binary folk in your gym and transgender people in your gym and and making them comfortable what options do you have so we actually demolished the wall in between the two demolished all the crappy drywalled stalls that were kind of half-ass put in there and then got the nice changing rooms from uh, law and forms and we have i think seven changing rooms in there one's ada accessible and it's a unisex gender neutral changing area and it is freaking amazing because if you need to go change, you have stalls to go in and change. There's communal cubbies. Parents can be there together with their kids. Bathrooms are both gender neutral and it solved that headache to the point where I almost forgot that that was ever an issue. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. So you just set up like a bunch of different stalls and people can just take whichever one they want. Yeah. Mm hmm. Because that's a very common problem, especially up here in Vancouver. You know, the criticism that people often bring up is, well, look, we'd love to have a whole bunch of different options, but we just can't afford the space to have multiple different changing rooms. And that's totally understandable if you live in a high cost of living city, but there's always a solution, right? And I think you bring up a good one. You can just subdivide the area into individual changing stalls and there you go. Yeah. And also, too, if your culture is correct, like if if you squash any like potentially toxic or creepy or absurd behavior you don't get the weird vibes or the like awkward changing area or the stairs like we have a gym full of incredible people we have a great community and we haven't had a single complaint about the gender neutral changing area yeah yeah well something i'd like to also dig into here you'd mentioned this earlier in the chat but i think it probably merits exploring more i'd love to get your opinion on financing and whether that's something that really is required for jujitsu you know you talked about how you basically self-funded got off the ground and, and took on credit card debt, but I'm guessing probably you wouldn't recommend that for a lot of people. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this for new gym owners who are trying to get off the ground. Do you recommend they try to bootstrap and just not take on any debts? Or do you recommend they get financing from somewhere? I'm, I'm just wondering what you would say based on your experience is the best path forward for most people. So here's the answer I give to any student that asks me any jiu-jitsu. And it's almost always the same answer. It depends. 
it really does depend on you as an individual. If you don't have the support and you really absolutely want to chase this dream, you got to bootstrap it. But there are ways to go about it successfully. Like if you can start off small, like I know people that have started off in garage gyms to build a small base before they move into a facility. So having that initial like 10 or 20 students, especially if you build the right culture, that will make a world of difference. So I have a second location in Burien. It's about 15, 20 minutes away from my primary gym. It's actually not the same team. I rebranded it in April to Burien Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And part of why I did that, I was managing two locations as one business. And between having a baby and growing gyms, like it was getting very difficult to manage. So I had another brown belt coach who had a slightly different vision than mine. So to put them over there and I rebranded the facility. So it was his vision and his dream for his reality. And while I used the CA, the Combat Arts Academy funding to budget that gym, it was done in a way where it didn't surmount any crazy debt. And also too, like within three to four months, that was profitable. Like it's about to be, to backtrack a little bit to before I brought up the funding with CA. So for Burian Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I did use capital from Combat Arts Academy to get it started. So I already had that kind of initial seed money because of my existing business. And we made the split in April. So Burian Brazilian Jiu Jitsu started with 30 students. Within the last three months, it's doubled in size. And within the next two to three months, it's projected to be profitable. So having that initial startup will make a world of difference, especially if you don't have mass or if you don't have the equipment. And there's different ways to go about doing that. One way is crowdfunding. Like if you have a group of people that want to build this dream with you, they can help. I did that in Portland. My friend Greg, he's a Muay Thai guy. He's phenomenal. He really, really wanted to start a gym down there and there's in Combat Arts Academy. And what we did was we fundraised. We had people that really, really believed in Greg's vision and they wanted to do a lifetime membership. We had people that contributed small amounts. We had people that we had family that, that contributed larger amounts and helped to get the gym off the ground. We started that January of 2020 and it was on course to break even when COVID hit. And that was within two months. And so there's a way to do it correctly if it's something that you really want to do. Is that making sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know people who've used all different approaches, right? I mean, I know people who have done basically a complete bootstrap where they come in with no money and they start extremely small and scale up from there. That can be done, like you said, if you can piggyback on top of another gym, for instance, maybe if there's a local karate gym and they'll let you run jujitsu classes out of their gym, that's a pretty low cost way to, to get off the ground. But failing that, if you do need funding, there's a lot of ways to do it, right? You can, I mean, you can, of course, get financing from a bank through a bank loan, but you brought up some good examples of how you could even do almost like a crowdfunding campaign to get off the ground too. And I could see that working mm -hmm. as well. The only thing I would ask then is, and this kind of ties into my next question, when you are crowdfunding, do you have to worry about whether these people who have funded you are now going to expect to be co-owners of the business? Do you have to have a, almost like a shareholder relationship with them now where you're beholden to them? Because I can just imagine that if people have crowdfunded your gym, they might have a different mentality of ownership towards the gym than regular customers would. Oh yeah, no, not at all. We had people that paid for like their first month of membership for whenever we opened as a way to give that initial seed money to people that wanted to buy a t-shirt. We And again, we had family and friends that just wanted to support. So in no way, shape or form, do they want to be a part of the business? And again, part of it comes with setting expectations. And this also ties into the topic of business partners. Sometimes you have the business partner that's the financial person, and then you have the, this, the business partner that's hands-on. And then what happens in this world of jiu-jitsu is there's no communication about expectations there's no operating agreement there's no like there's no understanding of what sweat equity means when you go into a partnership with somebody who has money and so i think it's really important to dig deep in research and know what you're getting into before you do it instead of the eager beaver overzealous like hell yeah let, let's get this going mm -hmm. also too like going into partnership with somebody that you absolutely trust and can absolutely communicate with is crucial but better yet somebody that you can actually debate with and get into an argument with 
because the second things don't go your way, you have to figure out how to come to a solution together. And again, like I think a lot of people have a hard time getting into difficult conversations. I'm at a point in my life where I had that crappy relationship. I've been at that rock bottom. I didn't talk about my feelings and it got me to a place that I didn't want to be. So I flipped that narrative really quickly and I started being honest, very, very, very honest and not in like a mean or negative way, but honest in a way where like, Hey, you know, I feel like this isn't working. I sense some tension. Can we talk about this? What are you feeling? Can we figure out a solution to whatever's going on right now? Whether that's with an employee, a student, a coach, a training partner, a teammate, like that, that needs to be a standard practice, like being able to actually talk through issues instead of avoiding the conflict. I think most people are conflict avoidant. And if you don't know how to resolve those conflicts, then those relationships tend to blow up. Yeah, yeah. Makes a ton of sense. Now, while we're actually talking about this, I would love to get your opinion on whether or not it makes sense to pursue business partnerships. That's actually a really common thing that comes up when people start their jujitsu gym is they, you know, they, they want to do it with a few of their buddies, or maybe there's someone who's not going to be directly involved, but they, they have the budget to get this thing off the ground. So often people will put together this loose coalition of, of partners who are going to launch this new business. But I think people often aren't prepared for what exactly that entails. I mean, if you are going into business with someone, that is a very, very complicated decision. And it's very hard to back out of or change your mind later. So you've got to be really sure that you're partnering with the right people and that you and those people have a working relationship that you're going to be able to actually execute on. There's a lot of businesses that die, not because there's a problem with the business necessarily, but because the ownership structure is just a total mess and eventually people just walk away or it just devolves into squabbling and bickering. And so I think that's always an area where people don't put enough thought into these things up front, which is they think, oh, well, you know, yeah, I've, I've been buddies with this person for five years. We get along great. So of course we'll make good business partners. But man, <laughs> if you, if you want to lose a friendship, there's no faster way to do it than to be partnered on a failing business or a troubled business, right? Because that, that's when you start to see relationships really fall apart. So I, I would suggest that most people out there probably don't put enough thought into who they're partnering with. And I'd love to get your opinion on that and your thoughts on that as well, because it sounds like you had a lot of partners out of the gate. I am laughing right now because that is exactly what happened. And it's not that they were bad business partners at all. It's that nobody had any idea what we were doing. Nobody, none of us. There's not one business person amongst the group. It was pretty gnarly. And on top of that, there's not a lot of solid communication and everybody else had day jobs. And so it was just a hobby and a backup project for pretty much everybody else. And because my name was on a lot of stuff, I like the bank accounts and stuff, like I was responsible for a lot of it. And so the recommendation I have as little as possible, like, you have to 100% get along with the person that you're going into business with. With that being said, if you have somebody who's looking to fund you, you don't have to go into business with them. You can take out a loan from that person. You could do it on the fly, or you can actually go into, the, into a bank and get it done legally and officially. That way, nobody gets screwed over. And yeah, I know like partnerships, if not done properly, it is... It's just waiting to blow up. I actually pursued a partnership with a different... So just heads up, all of my belts are from different professors. I've been, I think, a part of officially six different affiliations, technically speaking. And again, as a blue belt running a gym that's falling apart, I thought I needed other people to help save it. And so I entered into a partnership with a team where I thought I needed them to help keep things afloat. And in a way I did. But going to business wasn't necessarily the best option because we didn't have the same vision. And while on the surface we got along, we didn't resolve conflicts well together. They had their perception of how to handle things and I had mine. I was called stubborn, unorthodox, opinionated because of how I do things. And so if you enter that partnership, like you have to be on the same page on all things. And if not, you have to be able to have a conversation about how to get on the same page. It's like any relationship, right? Like if if you're dating somebody, you can't just pretend like the issue isn't there because at some point that resentment will creep up and at some point it will all blow up. 
Yeah, yeah. Makes tons of sense. And like you said, the the trick with partnerships is that they're very, very hard to get out of. It's one thing if you've got a loan. If someone has loaned money to you, yes, you're obligated to pay it back. But you have a lot of ways that you can do that and still maintain your independence. Whereas if you have co-owners in the business, man, it is very difficult to disentangle someone from the business. And this is assuming that they want to be disentangled. You know, if you have a, a shareholder in your business who wants to be a shareholder and refuses to sell and back out, you're kind of stuck with them. So I always generally suggest to people that if you're going to give people equity in your company, you've got to be really sure that that's the best option. Uh, it's usually better to try other approaches first, because if you decide, you know, two years later that uh, the way that we structured the loan wasn't ideal. Well, at least it's still a loan that you can pay off. But if you decide two years later that the the ownership structure of the company doesn't work, you've got a big, big problem to sort out. So I think that a lot of people out of the gate, because when you're starting a new business, you know, it sounds like, oh, yeah, I'll give everyone shares in this thing because they're not worth anything. So whatever, right? It's, I can give people stuff for free. But you're going to very quickly have a change of tune if your company starts to succeed, because now you've got these people who are part of the business and you you can't get rid of them. You're stuck with them forever. And that might be a decision you come to regret at some point. So I think some like words of wisdom too, for people looking to get into the business of jiu-jitsu, talk to other gym owners. And if they're not willing to talk to you out of fear of competition or whatever it is, find somebody else. Because personally speaking, I'm always open to talking to anybody who wants to start a gym, but understand what it means to go into a business, understand like what payroll is, taxes that you owe, what you're obligated to handle. Understand when you sign a lease, like, you are responsible for it. There is something called a personal guarantee. If you sign a commercial lease, you are personally responsible to pay it even if you go under. So there's a lot of stuff that that goes into the initial business startup. Like see if it's something you really want to do. You might actually thrive better coaching for somebody else maybe really want that autonomy and you can't handle this then do the business side of it but there is a lot that goes into it and on top of that like do your research like what is equity how can you share equity are you going to do the operating agreement on your own or are you going to actually hire somebody from the legal realm to handle it for you and that's one thing i would actually recommend everybody do get a legal agreement in place that way nobody can screw anybody else over yeah yeah because right? that might not be your intention going into it but at some point when visions change when life changes right maybe somebody's moving out of state maybe somebody wants to sell or maybe like there's a big life circumstance where they now need money or maybe once present now they're gone they stop showing up they stop teaching like what what are your fail safes yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny you bring that up. Lawyers are often, you know, people look at lawyers as being incredibly expensive. But honestly, the lawyer fees are one of the expenses that are almost always worth it at the end of the day. You're way better off paying a lawyer a few hundred, maybe a few thousand bucks to get the stuff sorted out now versus winding up in a dispute or a problem later and realizing you don't have a leg to stand on because you don't have a formal agreement in place. And here's the flip side of that. When you start a gym by the bootstraps, you don't have the finances to do it. So you're like, it'll be fine. We'll be fine. No big deal. The one thing I wish in hindsight that we did do was the legal agreement. I wish that some of the funding that I put into the business, I had put into a legal counsel instead. So that's the one thing I think that everybody should do regardless of your financial ability. If you can't afford to get an agreement, don't go into business with somebody else or wait until you can. Right, right. Now, one other thing to discuss here, you brought this up a few times that you've tried out several different affiliations. And this is also a common question that people come up with when they want to start a gym is, okay, should I affiliate? And if so, with who? Or should I do this independently? And there's a lot of variables that go into something like that, right? I don't know if there is a really a good answer that applies to everyone. Oh, man. But I would love to hear your thought process on this because it is something where, of course, every affiliation under the sun will make all sorts of promises about what they can do or, and cannot do for you. And they'll they'll make a lot of claims. But my guess is in a lot of cases, those may or may not materialize. And I would just want to hear your experience in terms of what to look out for if someone is uh, pursuing a potential affiliation for their gym. That is a very, not a tricky question. It's a little bit of a loaded question. Affiliations are the norm within jiu-jitsu because again, you, and I think I'm a unique case because I don't have one particular professor that I came up under. I think for somebody that comes up 
under one professor through all of their ranks. You feel the need to affiliate underneath them. Wonderful. I think that's great. I think if you're on the independent side of things, or maybe you and your professor don't work out, you feel like you need to affiliate because you feel like you need some weight behind your name, or maybe you're not a black belt and you need somebody to promote you. Those kind of have all been things that I've dealt with because I've been running this gym since the blue belt. And for the last year and a half, up until I received my black belt, we were involved in running this gym without an affiliation, without a professor, without being un- underneath anybody. And honestly, it didn't make a difference. Mm. It made zero difference. I've been part of affiliations where you pay the big fat monthly uh, affiliation fee, and then you have to bring out the black belt twice a year for an expensive seminar where you're not actually learning anything. I've been part of affiliations that are chill, and I've been a part of teams that make you patch up your yi. And it's one of those things where you have to do what feels best for you, but do it without the obligation of it. Do it because you want to. The year and a half that we were unaffiliated, honestly, like it was glorious because we did whatever we needed to do to grow our business our way. At this point, like I, so my black belt is from Hanette Stock. She is incredible. She's a great person. She is the co-founder of Brazil 21. While I'm not an affiliate of Brazil 21, I respect Hanette immensely and I happily put on a Brazil 21 patch on my gi because of that respect. And, and that's where I think the, the trick is, do you respect that affiliation? Are you, is it something that will be a core part of you? Or are you doing it out of sheer obligation because you have to? Yeah, yeah. And I would also suggest that people should probably be pretty wary just of claims that a lot of affiliations will make. You know, they'll say, oh, if you join our affiliation, the brand name is so powerful that it'll double or triple your customer base. I mean, I'd I'd be very skeptical of this, right? It's important to remember that these affiliations, they're there to make money too. So they're only interested in affiliating Mm -hmm. with you because they think they're going to get more money out of you than they're going to put in. So you have to be very, very skeptical of any affiliation and the claims they make. That's not to say they're all bad or that you shouldn't join one, but just that they will make a ton of claims about how much they're going to help your business. And from what I've seen, most of the time, those claims don't pan out. So read through whatever documents you have to sign if you're choosing to do an affiliation, because oftentimes we will be locked into like a two or three year agreement. And if that's the case, like if you need to change it, they're going to try to make you pay a fee. And but this is where, and again, there are some great affiliations out there. It's not all a bad thing. Like I do think it's nice to have that familial feel. Like if you go drop into a different gym, like it's the same team. But again, those teams start off in house. It's, it's the independent gym that's trying to find a place where you feel like you have to join this big thing to be successful. When in reality, you just have to focus on your own program and growth and find the issues that need to get fixed if that makes sense yeah yeah that makes tons of sense perfect well i mean that's pretty all-encompassing here i think in terms of topics one other thing i'd like to ask is because you know you talked about trying to balance running your gym with parental responsibilities and of course if you're a mom there's a lot of a lot of responsibilities that come with that i'd love to get your perspective just in general on you know as a female gym owner what does that mean to you are there any special considerations or challenges that that you've encountered that you think a a guy doing the same thing would be less likely to experience? You know, I have encountered, I would say, quite a bit of misogyny in my 10 years of gym owning and 13 years of training. I think I mentioned this earlier, I've been called strong, opinionated, stubborn, unorthodox in a negative connotation throughout my years of gym owning. And I don't think that would be said to a guy doing the exact same thing that I'm doing. I think strong, opinionated, unorthodox, and stubborn would be positive qualities. It's been a very interesting journey trying to find my place in this world. And one thing I absolutely appreciate and respect is my team because without the team that I have, I don't know how I would be able to balance all of what I've been doing. But even more so, I have this incredible partner, my husband Garrett. He is stay-at-home dad. He coaches about 10 hours a week. He does gym projects. He is my support person. And without him, I would not be able to sustain this lifestyle that I've created for myself. Because I currently, I teach 25 hours a week. I probably train about 10 hours a week. I spend anywhere from four to eight hours a week on conditioning and rehab. 
and strength training. And that's the important part because if I miss that, then I start to break down in training. On top of all the business stuff, on top of being a mom, we, I nursed my toddler for the first, I said toddler, she's still a baby to me, 17 months. The first year she was ex- exclusively breastfed. And I mean, it was on demand. Like I would be teaching and feeding her and walking around while I'm teaching. And here's a fun, here's a fun thing. It was normalized in our gym. This should be normalized. Motherhood should be normalized. When I say that, because I can have full on conversations with our guys while breastfeeding my baby and nobody says anything. There's no looks, there's no awkwardness. I've met many moms who feel uncomfortable feeding their babies in the gym or bring the, or bringing the baby to the gym. And I know there's some great gyms out there where it's very like all encompassing in that sense, one big family. But more often than not, it's not normalized. People get weird about it. So once I started, other moms do the same thing. They had no issues feeding their babies in the gym. Um, and I say that because it shouldn't be weird being a mom and a business owner and a coach while training jiu-jitsu all in one go. So my toddler, she lives in the gym. She is there for all the classes while they're teaching or training. Like she hangs out with all of our families. It's entire like gym that's been the support system for me. That was a big, long ramble, huh? <laughs> well, I think it's important <laughs> to talk about, though, because, you know, this is a very male dominated sport. And even putting aside the obvious misogyny that people encounter sometimes, there's also just you brought up a good example of subtle signals and norms that we need to challenge in jujitsu. I mean, if we ever want to get past the situation where like almost all people are men and women really don't train jujitsu in any meaningful number, I think in order to get past that, we need to normalize things like what you talked about. So I think it's important to bring that up and to act as a leader in this space for sure. Absolutely. And that actually ties back when like with the transparency and authenticity. Like if you're teaching jujitsu, if you're running a gym, you're a leader, you are a role model. Role model isn't always a good thing. It could be a negative thing. So you have this power to influence all of these people for the better. And so the choices you make dictate the path that your students follow. And this actually ties back a little bit with what happened with the pandemic where some gyms took a very like oh, screw masks or screw this like it and then some gyms took a very like pro mask like we're doing all the steps to be careful it was the leader uh it was the leader of the gym created that culture with our professor during the pandemic he actually left when i was nine months pregnant and a big part of it was a little political with the masking and whatnot and that lack of leadership created a really weird divide with it within our gym and community mm-hmm. And and so I think within that leadership role, like you have to be clear with your intentions, you have to communicate, you have to like really like live by what you say, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that was an amazing chat, Sonia. Anything that you wanted to cover that we didn't get into or did we touch on all of the main points here today? I had actually two things. One, one thing we didn't talk about too much was hiring staff in terms of like administrative stuff. Is that something that you want to add to this conversation? Yeah, sure. Let's go for it. So I think one thing for any and all gym owners to recognize like it is really crucial that when you start to feel that burnout in the beginning that that's a sign you need to hire administrative staff and administrative staff isn't just the front of the house or front desk like they are going to be they're the face of your gym and part of what that means too is training them you can't just hire somebody like all right here's the phone here's the computer here's the email good luck go like you have to either come up with a process on your own or come up with a process with them and guide them on how you want things to be run and if you don't know how ask other people go talk to other gym owners like go walk into other gyms go check out a 24 fitness or alley fitness and see what their process is because they have processes and and you can start to shape your business based on that and the other thing too like hiring your admin staff like it can't be at minimum wage like if you want to retain good people if you want them to bring you new students and prospective students and sign people up like they have to be paid a living wage not just minimum and not just a trade for their membership because they are a core integral part of building your business if you want to be successful currently we have two front desk staff and i have a whole lot of coaches and the front desk staff they do so much work one is nearly 40 hours a week and the other one is at about 30 hours a week. I don't handle any of the trial scheduling or signups or phone calls anymore. 
And that gives me time to focus on other projects that I need to do as well as plan my classes and focusing on the students. So if a student has a money question, I direct them to the front desk as the gym owner and coach. I try to keep that separation. In the beginning, it was all me. But by having that separation, it allows me to focus on the jujitsu. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. And that's something that I think every business owner starts to eventually hit is that point of burnout because there's now too much administrative stuff that needs to be done. And I think that's a really cognizant point you bring up that once you start to feel that burnout, that's often a good indication that you're carrying too much by yourself. And it's probably time to start thinking about hiring help. Absolutely. Because too, when you get to that point, things start to slip through the cracks. That person's bill didn't get paid. That phone call wasn't returned. That person wanted to sign up but nobody got back to them. Uh, emails have been left on red for like two or three days or four days. The mats didn't get cleaned. Like, or the bathrooms, the bathrooms weren't cleaned. All of those things start to add up. And then the less time you have, the less you do, the more things fall apart. And then people start to quit because they feel that trickle down onto the mats. And so to keep that culture strong, you have to delegate when you feel that burnout hitting or when for example, phone calls, like I got sick of doing phone calls. I had so many phone calls in a day that that's why I knew like I had to delegate as much of this as I could. And, and so that's a clear sign, like you need to do something about that issue before it becomes a bigger one. Awesome. Amazing. Anything else that we wanted to cover here or did we cover all of the big points so far? So one of the things that I think is really important as a female gym owner in this male dominated world is as you start to do things you have to do it without caring about other people's opinions and i think that's something that's integrated into us as a society it's a, it's a societal norm to be concerned with how we're perceived but one of the reasons why i'm at the point that i that i am is i stop caring what other people think about me i care about my opinion of myself and i care that i'm doing right by me and the best by my team and if those two boxes are checked off then I'm happy. If I hear that someone so said this or like, oh my gosh, if I do this, what if that person thinks this? Or oh my gosh, what if they get mad at me? It doesn't matter. Other people's opinions don't matter. And I think that's something that's that's hard to internalize. I mean, you see it with promotions. Oh man, like that person got promoted and I didn't. Like, oh, I'm not good enough. Or like, oh, what am I doing wrong? Or even just in, in class, that kind of negative stuff talk of, oh man, I'm never getting this move right. Like I should just quit. Or like, oh my gosh, what if I do it wrong and my partner or the black belt thinks that like I just suck at jujitsu? Like, what if my training partner talks about me behind my back? Like none of that matters as long as you're putting forth your best effort and you're living true yourself and being as authentic as possible. Awesome. Well, amazing, Sonia. Thank you so much for coming by. If people want to check out your gym, how do they go about learning more? We are on Instagram at Combat Arts Academy. Um, you can email us, call us, website, all, all of the usual stuff. And you can follow me on Instagram at Sonia Sillen. Yeah. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Awesome. And of course, as always, I'll put all of the links to that in the show notes. Thank you again for coming by, Sonia. And of course, to everyone who checks out our stuff, probably everyone knows. But if you want to head to bjjmentalmodels.com, there's a ton of free resources there. That's where you can get access to every episode we've ever done, plus our whole database of concepts. Join our awesome newsletter. Ton of stuff there. And if you want to kick it up the next notch, you can go to BJJ Mental Models Premium. The way to do that is premium.bjjmentalmodels.com com awesome resource with tons of stuff including over 50 hours at this point of instructional material that we offer as part of the premium package very unique audio based offering um, if you like audiobooks and you like jujitsu you're probably going to like it uh, beyond that of course what we also offer is our awesome coaching service which is part of the service as well so again check that out premium.bjjmentalmodels.com highly appreciate everyone there who gives it a go sonia thanks a lot for coming by really awesome chat greatly appreciated it I thought we covered a lot of cool things today, and I hope this is going to be a helpful conversation for people in a similar situation looking to get going with their jujitsu business. Thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure being here. Um, uh, if anybody out there ever wants to chat business, I'm happy to lend an ear. Awesome. And of course, to everyone out there who's listening, thanks to you as well. Always appreciate the time and attention, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care.